The 12th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry was raised in the spring of 1861 in the Boston area with Fletcher Webster, the son of famous U.S. Senator Daniel Webster, made its first colonel. In fact, they so identified with their colonel that they became known from then on as the Webster Regiment. They spent much of their early history on guard duty in Maryland until they joined the Army of the Potomac in the early part of 1862. The men of the 12th experienced combat for the very first time on the 18th of April in a minor skirmish while on picket duty along the Rappahannock River. They were assigned to the 3rd Corps of the newly formed Army of Virginia, and it was with the 3rd Corps that they would really first see a true battle. On August the 9th, they arrived late to the Battle of Cedar Mountain, but suffered 11 casualties from artillery fire there. A few weeks later, the 12th fought at the Second Battle of Bull Run, where they suffered 138 casualties. Among the dead that day was Colonel Webster, who fell in leading the defense of Chin Ridge with the regiment. After the Second Battle of Bull Run, there was some reorganization to the armies operating in the Eastern Theater, and the 12th Massachusetts was assigned to the First Corps under Joseph Hooker. Pretty soon they were back in Maryland, but this time not on guard duty, rather in pursuit of Lee's army, which had invaded the North for the first time. They were briefly engaged at South Mountain and then came here, where they were destined to suffer a higher casualty rate than any of the nearly 200 regiments in the Union Army at the Battle of Antietam. The night of the 16th was an uneasy one for the men. The soldiers slept with everything on them, ready for battle a moment's notice. There was sporadic shooting between pickets and constant movement by artillery and infantry. The men got little to no sleep that night as they bivouacked along the Smoketown Road. On the morning of September 17th, the 334 officers and men of the 12th Massachusetts rose before dawn to the sounds of the opening artillery duel that preceded the first attack. The First Corps was selected to begin the attack on the extreme right of the Union line. Doubleday's division on the right, Meade's division in the center, and Ricketts division on the left. Hartsoff's brigade, which included the 12th Massachusetts, belonged to Ricketts' division and was intended to be in the first wave alongside a brigade under Duryea. They lined up with the 83rd New York on the left, the 13th Massachusetts next, then the 11th Pennsylvania, and the 12th Massachusetts to the right of the brigade. Now keep in mind, this is just three weeks after the Second Battle of Bull Run. This brigade lost 700 men in that battle. They haven't even had a chance to recover from that fight, and now they find themselves at the center of some of the deadliest action in the history of American warfare. The two brigades began side by side, but soon after they started, Hartsuff stopped his men because he wanted to go out and rick and order the ground a little bit in front of him. now along a 1.6 mile trail that allows you to actually follow in the footsteps of the first core attack that morning. Uh, I'm facing south currently which is the direction of the attack so if I turn around over here you can see the cornfield just maybe 100-150 yards in that direction 
So where I'm walking at the moment is right along uh, the path. There's a road just on this side of me here. Uh, I believe it's Mansfield Road. And so I'm walking pretty near to where the 12th Massachusetts would have been advancing on that morning. It's a great place to get a real ground level look at the terrain at the ups and downs because the, the terrain here is fascinating. It's, there's little rolling hills and ridges. And so there's places on the battlefield where as you're marching through the cornfield, you would be pretty well protected from enemy fire, except for artillery, of course, uh, but small arms fire, certainly. Uh, but then you will come up to certain places where you'll suddenly be in view and then dip down again. So uh, that explains why some regiments suffered horribly and maybe the regiment right next to them suffered far fewer casualties because that's how quickly the terrain changes here. As he was reconnoitering the position, Hartsuff was wounded in the hip. He initially tried to continue to do his duty. He stayed on his horse, but very soon the loss of blood forced him to the ground. Suddenly the brigade was without its commander and it stopped. While it stopped, the brigade of Durye, who it was supposed to be attacking alongside, continued its attack here into the cornfield. Without support on its flank, Duryea's brigade was destroyed in its attack. It took about a half hour before the brigade under Hartsuff was able to get up and moving again, this time under Colonel Richard Coulter of the 11th Pennsylvania. By this point, they were moving into the cornfield behind Duryea's brigade, almost like a second wave of the attack. And standing now in the east-west portion of the cornfield trail, that would be east that we're looking right now, and the left wing of the brigade would have been going through those woods, while the right wing of the brigade, which included the 12th Massachusetts, would have been here, coming through the cornfield. I'm in the middle of the cornfield now. You can see the corn, how high it is. It's a couple of feet higher than I am and I'm nearly six feet tall so that gives you a sense of how tall it was. You can see just nothing right now. So the brigade, each regiment of the four regiments in the brigade uh, sent forward two companies as skirmishers and so the skirmishers would have been out front. Uh, when they got to this rail fence it slowed them down and though you can't really see it from here there was artillery on the high ground, just on the other side of this cornfield. And that artillery under Stephen Dill Lee began to just tear huge holes in the regiment. Major Sidney Burbank, who was in command of the regiment as it marched through this cornfield, fell mortally wounded early in the fight. The two regiments on the right here in the cornfield actually had an easier time uh, getting into position for the attack than the ones that were in the woods to the left, and so they were out front and so suffered the brunt of the artillery fire. But you can see here this high ground in front of us. And that high ground, of course, as I mentioned before, meant that you were a more conspicuous target. The rebel skirmishers were on this high ground and as the Union lines pushed forward, they very quickly were able to drive off those skirmishers. But then as they come up to this rise, they come under small arms fire.
Confederate defensive line was here on the southern end of the cornfield. By the time the 12th Massachusetts got into line to be able to start firing volleys, they were facing the Louisianans of Harry Hayes. They unloaded a couple of volleys. Hayes, Louisianans fired volleys in return. It was close fighting. They never got to the place where it was hand to hand, but it was close enough that a volley was absolutely just as deadly as it can be. But they continued to fire. They continued to fight. Eventually they were actually able to drive the Louisianans back, but reinforcements came up for the Confederates and soon they found themselves, the 12th did, facing off against the 1st Texas, who would go on to be the Confederate regiment that suffered the highest casualty rate here at the Battle of Antietam. Eventually the 12th, they've now lost their commander, Major Burbank. They've lost a great deal of men, but they continue to fight until they run low on ammunition and they were forced to fall back. The 90th Pennsylvania moved up into their position and allowed the 12th to fall back. fighting that day in the cornfield was confused and it was awful and it was over for the most part in less than a half hour. When all was said and done, Hearts of Brigade was taken to the rear. They were refit and around three o'clock in the afternoon they called the roll to see how many effectives they had among the four regiments who had gone into combat that morning. It was just under 300 who remained of the men who had gone into fighting. For the 12th Massachusetts, if you look at the casualty figures, you'll find that they are listed as having suffered somewhere around 65% casualties in their fighting. But that doesn't tell the whole story, even though that number already makes them the unit that suffered the highest casualty rate of any in the Union Army that day. You see, one of their companies had actually been held back on headquarters duty and was not engaged in the fighting. And so out of the men who actually went forward into the cornfield, who actually attacked the Confederates that day, the number of casualties was actually closer to about 80% of the men who fought. They were able to walk out of the cornfield with their colors, with something around 35 to 40 men able to bear arms. Of the men who were killed that day or died of their wounds, most of them are buried here in the Antietam National Cemetery. In the years following the American Civil War, many of the men who fought formed fraternal organizations such as the Grand Army of the Republic to remember and to get together. They had local posts much like today there's the VFW or the Foreign Legion. Those men began to raise money to place monuments to their regiments at battlefields of note. Most of those uh, monuments for individual regiments ended up at Gettysburg. There are some here at Antietam. States also did the same. They would place state monuments in honor of all of their men who fought. And in the Eastern Theater, most of those state monuments were placed at the Gettysburg battlefield, but not Massachusetts. Their state monument is here on the southern edge of the cornfield near where so many 
of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, brave men gave their last full measure of devotion. Mm -hmm.